Bueno, pues buenas tardes. Muchísimas gracias por su espera. Eh, les, no me alcanzan las palabras para pedirles una disculpa por la demora, pero les aseguro que fue mucho más allá de nuestras posibilidades llegar por los bloqueos en la calle y bueno, quizá mi impericia para darme vueltas en no prohibidas. Pero bueno, aquí estamos y espero de todo corazón que la espera, tanto los que estén en, on, online como los que están aquí, valga la pena. Déjenme decirles que Megan Horton es una de las colegas con las que más he gozado de colaborar en la vida, no solo por su liderazgo y su brillantez intelectual, sino por su calidad humana y su personalidad maravillosa que la van a gozar ahorita. Eh, ella estudió en la Universidad de Columbia eh, desde el doctorado, hizo dos postdoctorados y ahora es miembro del Departamento de Salud Ambiental de Mount Sinai, la Escuela de Medicina de Mount Sinai. Y la gran contribución del trabajo de Megan es que está estudiando eh, el efecto de las exposiciones ambientales en la salud humana y en particular neurodesarrollo, pero a través de imágenes, eh, a través de resonancia magnética. Y el trabajo que ella está liderando es pionero en esta área de salud ambiental en donde combina las ciencias de, para medir exposición, pero también para medir desenlaces a través de eh, resonancias magnéticas. Yo estoy segura que va a ser algo muy novedoso con respecto a lo que ustedes han estudiado. Y bueno, pues de verdad le agradezco mucho a Megan y que no haya entrado en shock por mi manera de manejar. I hope that you are not very stressed because of my driving. <risa> Pero bueno, pues muchísimas gracias porque estén aquí. Megan actualmente es la presidenta del International Society for Children's Health and the Environment y yo me siento muy contenta de ser vicepresidenta con ella porque trabajar con Megan es, es un privilegio en la vida y bueno, ojalá la disfruten. Thank you, Megan, and sorry for your welcome to Cuernavaca <laughs> with this traffic. Good afternoon, buenas tardes. Thank you so much for your patience and for waiting. Um, I look forward to giving this talk, and Mara, thank you for the invitation, for having me here today. Um, I will tell you that even when I give an, a, new, a talk in New York, people say I speak too fast, so don't hesitate to tell me to slow down, to Mas espacio, por favor. Um, otherwise, I get going and I get going. So slow me down. As Mara said, I'm an associate professor at Mount Sinai in the um, Department of Environment, Environmental Medicine and Public Health. So what we're interested in is studying environmental risk factors for public health outcomes. In addition to being in the department, I'm in the Institute for Exposomics. How many of you have heard of the term exposomics? It's a show of hands. I hope so, <laughs> some of you. Um, so I'll talk about exposomics today and I'll talk about some new tools that we're using in my lab to take an exposomic approach to understanding how early life environmental risk factors impact children's health, in particular, um, their brain health throughout their life course. Do we? <laughs> Oh, well, no, no, I took it off. I can stand there in advance. I can do it. Do you want to save it to the desktop? Maybe it's the... 
no, como no se descargó. One sixty six working. Can you move a little bit to your that side? Sir. Thank you. So much anticipation. So I'm in the Institute for Exposomic Research. Exposomic research or the exposome is a term defined or developed to identify risk factors for health outcomes that it's everything in the environment that's not genomic. So we spent a lot of money and time with the Human Genome Project and identifying associations between genetic markers and human health outcomes. The exposome is designed to complement the genome with everything that's not genomic. So it could be um, chemical toxic exposures, social exposures, nutrition, socioeconomic status, where you're living, all those things that are not genomic. And there are a couple key pieces of the exposome is it's not looking at a single time point, but it's looking at the effect of the exposome over the life course. So from pregnancy through early childhood, all the way up through aging and senescence. In my lab, we're interested in a couple unique things, particular pieces about the exposome. And it's this part right here in early life or exposures that occur during pregnancy and early life and how those affect the trajectory of health throughout the life course. So today I'm talking about a few tools that we use to address these specific time periods. One is some tools that we're using to look at critical windows of exposure and what are critical windows of exposure and why are these important to identify from a public health perspective. Another tool that we'll use is looking at exposure to mixtures. So the field of epidemiology began really looking at single chemicals and single outcomes. Many of us know the example of thinking about children's blood lead and IQ. That was looking often at a lead exposure in a child at a single time point and looking at an, IQ, at, a, at an IQ in childhood, which was a pretty easy statistical approach, a linear regression, controlling for confounders. When we're looking at exposure to mixtures, things get very complicated. And we know that individuals are not exposed to a single chemical, but multiple chemicals and multiple different exposures, like I mentioned, socioeconomic, nutrition, et cetera. So how do we look at those and how do we look at those over time? So not just looking at a single time point. And finally, how do we look at what's going on in the brain? So I'll talk about the magnetic resonance tool, the magnetic resonance imaging or MRI tool that we use to look in vivo at the human brain to see how these exposures impact development. So for critical windows of exposure, I'll talk about the novel net methodology that we use um, leveraging deciduous teeth or naturally said baby teeth. Um, and I hope you can see with the light that this is a small GIF looking at, and I'll talk about this more in detail in the talk, but it's showing exposures moving over time throughout pregnancy and early childhood. And you can see that this is not a straight line. So we're looking only at three different chemicals here, but showing that the shape or the distribution of those chemicals changes considerably throughout pregnancy. So we need to look at all of pregnancy and childhood, not just at a single time point. When we talk about the tool that we've used to look at time series exposure to mixtures, I'll walk through briefly the statistical method we use that's called lagged WQS or lagged weighted quantile sum regression. And that's the methodology that's been developed at Mount Sinai to leverage this high dimensional mixtures data that we get from the teeth. And finally, I'll walk through what we're doing here in Mexico City at the Center for Medical Imaging and Instrumentation where we're doing MRIs on the kids in progress to look at structural and functional brain changes in the kids. So what is this concept of critical windows um, and developmental plasticity? Much of our understanding of this concept of developmental plasticity and the vulnerability of the developing brain came from David Barker, who was a physician in England in the late 1980s and 90s. What David Barker did that really changed our understanding of the developing fetus was that he looked at birth and death records of individuals born in England, um, and he linked that babies who are born low birth weight, 
who had moms who may have had low nutritional status, but were functioning fine. But the babies who had low birth weight had an increased risk in their 30s, 40s, and 50s for cardiometabolic diseases, for um, cardiac diseases and for being overweight or obese. So this is one of the first times that we started to recognize that what happened in that early life environment may have impacts on chronic diseases later in life. David Barker was very much interested in uh, nutrition and metabolic diseases, but um, neuroepidemiologists, psychologists, and other people in the field started to adopt this approach, the Barker hypothesis, and transformed it into the developmental origins of health and disease hypothesis. So this is the hypothesis stating that um, that early developmental influences can result in permanent changes in physiology and increase later disease risk. So this is so popularized that this is a Time Magazine cover in the United States in the late 90s, talking about how the first nine months of life can shape the rest of your life. This is really, now it seems very common sense to all of us in this room. We know that what happens during pregnancy can impact that child for the rest of their lives. But this is a fairly new concept. Um, how many of you have heard of the thalidomide disaster? Yeah, this is an um, unfortunate, horrible natural disaster in the 1950s and 60s. And I keep meaning to look up to see whether thalidomide was used in Mexico, and I'm not sure that it was. It was definitely not used in the United States, but it was widely used in Europe. Um, 70 to 100,000 women were prescribed thalidomide during their pregnancy to help, for, to help protect against morning sickness and fatigue that they experienced during pregnancy. So it was both a sedative and a hypnotic that made the women feel great, made them get up, they could cook breakfast again, they could be the healthy homemakers that they needed to be. But the unfortunate natural disaster was that um, children who were born to mothers who took thalidomide during their pregnancies um, were born with very unique, specific, and very, very gross um, malformations. Um, so these are some of the uh, some of the pictures, the, the unique malformations included um, things like cleft palate or malformations in the ears, particularly the outer ear and the inner ear, and then this epidemic of focomelia or a lack of development in the limbs and the fingers. The interesting thing um, that we could do with this example was we could tie um, very specific exposures in terms of timing with these developmental outcomes. And this gave rise to that concept of critical windows of vulnerability. So this is a graphic looking at um, on the top is days post-conception for the developing fetus. And I'm not sure how well you can see, but each one of these bars is showing what organ system or what part of the body is developing during that time period. And what doctors could see is that if a woman, um, if a woman, I'm really failing at the pointer. Um, if a woman took the drug very early, such as 20 to 23 days post-conception, the child was born with a very specific malformation in their outer ear. However, if the woman took the drug, if the pregnant mom took the drug later, that ear was already formed, it was less vulnerable to perturbation. It was protected because it was already formed. And you can see that, we could see that um, physicians could track because they had medical records of when the women were taking their, their pills and what type of outcome came out of their kids. They were very, very clearly able to link those critical windows of vulnerability. And this was revolutionary because it was really in the 1950s and 60s that physicians still thought that the placenta was a perfect barrier. It thought it knew what to block the cigarette smoke, et cetera, alcohol. You might even have remembered movies where um, the doctor's smoking in the room where he's seeing a pregnant woman or she's seeing a pregnant woman. Um, so it really was up until this example, uh, physicians thought that the placenta was the perfect barrier. And we learned through this egregious example with thalidomide that it wasn't. And things that had no adverse health impact on the mom could have very dramatic health impacts on the developing fetus and child. So this is a similar graphic, um, just demonstrating uh, embryonic and fetal development on the top. And again, identifying in these blocks, um, sensitive periods versus vulnerable periods and showing that um, if you took a drug or a chemical insult um, at a time when that organ system was developing, you'd be more vulnerable. So that's the conclusion of this paper and this work, demonstrating that an exposure that's coincident with the developmental process is more likely to have adverse effects. When we think about this in terms of the human brain, we have a very long and very complicated um, developmental window or critical window. 
Brain development, as we know, begins very early in pregnancy, right after conception. And what we're showing here is time on the x-axis with birth and then months and years post-conception. And each one of these slopes or bright colored lines is a domain or a function that's developing at that time. You can see the rapid slope in development in all of the major functions in the brain. So sensory um, pathways such as vision and hearing, um, rapid development in language, and then a slightly slower but still rapid development in higher cognitive and emotional processing functions. Um, and so what you can see is that not only is it important to think about the critical windows very early on, but many of these windows are extending throughout adolescence and adulthood. This graphic was made based on data from about 2020, or sorry, 2010. If we could redo this graphic, um, we would take that red line and we would probably flatten it out and have it extend because now we know that the developing human brain isn't mature even until late, um, in late adolescence, early adulthood. So now we're thinking more like 25, 30 years old. So we have this very long, very dynamic and non-linear critical window for, for the brain. So that brings up some very interesting questions on how do we measure exposure and when do we measure exposure if we have this extended and dynamic critical window. Oh, I did want to mention that um, despite this dramatic development after um, continued development in adolescence and adulthood, the, the human brain reaches its volumetric size um, or maximum size at about five years of age. But much of that continued growth and development and change is due to synaptogenesis, so adding more connections or reducing connections um, or myelination. So considerable changes that are happening um, after the brain has reached its actual size. So how do we start to look at exposures, particularly exposures in early pregnancy and early childhood? Some of the traditional biomarkers we rely on in environmental epidemiology include blood and urine. So we collect maternal blood at, at specific time points during pregnancy, often trying to coincide those um, blood draws for research along with any clinical blood draw so we don't have to stick a woman unnecessarily. We can collect urine samples. Um, we try to collect a cord blood sample when the baby is born. But because of some of the constraints of the institutional review boards and trying not to burden the mom too much, it's unlikely that we would get more than a few of those samples during pregnancy. Um, and we don't really know that that's representative of the dynamic change in exposures during that pregnancy period. The other thing we know about um, these traditional biomarkers particularly if you're collecting a biomarker from the mom and trying to assume or calculate what the fetal exposure is, that the maternal biomarkers are not a very good proxy all the time for, for the fetal or embryonic exposure. So they're an indirect proxy. One of the examples I use for this is much of my work is looking at residential pesticide exposure in moms. Um, we work on a study in in Manhattan where 90% of the moms that we studied, about 700 moms, reported using pesticides during their pregnancy to control cockroaches. So we were very interested in how this pesticide could impact health. And we measured chlorpyrifos, one of the commonly used compounds, in maternal blood throughout pregnancy, and we measured it in cord blood. When we looked at the correlation between maternal blood samples and cord blood samples, we actually saw that levels of chlorpyrifos were considerably higher in the cord blood than they were in the mom's blood. This surprised us, but in retrospect, it makes sense because the mom has an intact and functioning metabolic system. She can metabolize and clear that chlorpyrifos, but the developing fetus and infant is still onboarding much of their kidney function and their liver function. So they can't metabolize that. So that chemical could stick around longer and have a considerably more adverse effect on the infant than it did on the mom. Um, so that's an example demonstrating that these, these samples may not be a good proxy for fetal exposure. The other part is if you've ever tried to collect a blood sample or a urine sample from a young child, it's nearly impossible. Um, collecting a urine sample has many challenges. We've tried collecting diapers, we've tried collecting, and it's very challenging to try to get those samples. And it's almost impossible to um, vene do venipuncture on an infant um, without causing distress, which is not something we'd wanna do for research purposes. So because of some of these problems with traditional biomarkers, Manisha Rora, who's a unique combination at Mount Sinai of being a dentist and a chemist, and just a brilliant person overall, um, developed this methodology to retrospectively and objectively quantify exposures throughout fetal life and early childhood using naturally shed deciduous teeth or baby teeth. So um, 
all children lose 20 teeth between the ages of five and 13. And we can collect these teeth and characterize exposure beginning from the second trimester of pregnancy because teeth begin developing during pregnancy right at that second period. And, um, and I'll talk a little bit about the physiology of the tooth that allows us to do this, but basically teeth grow like tree rings. So we've all heard that you can look at a tree ring and you can backtrack in the lines and you can see whether that year was a good year in terms of sunlight and rain, or if there was a fire or a drought, you can see that you can characterize that in the lines of the tree. Similar to you could in a glacier, you can backtrack core a glacier and see um, if there was considerably more carbon exposure or what was happening in that time period. With the teeth, the teeth is laying the the fetus is laying a layer of dental and enamel on a daily basis. So anything that's circulating through the fetal bloodstream comes up into the pulp of that tooth, gets into the dentine and enamel layer, and then that layer is removed from the fetal circulation. So not only are things stored in there, but they're no longer metabolized. There's no longer any metabolic capacity. It's almost like a computer hard drive. So on a daily basis, it just packs those back just like you do memory on your computer hard drive. So these are some graphic depictions of how this happens. So we're just looking here at a schematic of the tooth. On the top of the tooth is the white or the enamel that's popping up out of the gum first. Underneath that, we have the primary dentine that's formed um, prior to birth. Then we have the secondary dentine and then the pulp. And the pulp is the part where there's the fetal blood, throw, blood flow. And this graphic demonstrates how we're using that tooth to look at these um, layers where we can backtrack and look at exposure. So again, on the far left, we're just looking at the enamel and um, that first purple is the, the dentine layer that's being laid. And you can see how the dentine extension is downward as the tooth is pushing up, there's layers upon layers each day growing down. Um, well, the critical thing to this methodology is the formation of the neonatal line. So the neonatal line is formed at birth. No matter how that baby was born, whether it was a natural delivery or a section, there's this physiological marker of birth. And so we know from that tooth exactly when birth occurred, and we can count the layers of, um, of dentine and enamel that were formed prior to birth and count the, the layers um, born after birth. I'm not sure how well you can see in that um, graphic on the far right, which is a confocal microscope view of these layers, but you can, if we had, maybe it has to be darker, but you could see the actual layers of the teeth. What's really cool about this as well is that when Manish developed this method, he actually had to hand identify in a microscope that neonatal line and then count and forwards and backwards. But now this is all done with robots and algorithms. And so it's getting much faster and much more systematic as well as um, much more robust. Uh, this is an example of a tooth from a child who was born here in Mexico City, whose mom had blood in her lead and blood in her bones. And so they were looking at um, whether they could detect blood in the tooth for the child um, once the child lost the tooth. So we're looking at two different figures. The one on the left is, um, is showing in color where we can see lead in that tooth. So it's slicing the tooth down the middle. And in the, in the uh, blue on the top is low lead. And so that's sort of the, the primary dentine or very early during pregnancy. And if we were to map the timing of when we see that second red line with the, red, with the black arrows, that's like almost towards birth, the secondary dentine development. And that's where we see very high lead exposure which is associated with about 45 days in the graphic on the left, on the right. So on the right, we're looking at developmental time on the x-axis from um, that second trimester of pregnancy all the way through 200 days postnatal. And on the y-axis, we're looking at concentrations of lead in the tooth. We use calcium to control for lead, to control for differential growth. It's sort of a standardized marker so we can look at the same levels across. So it's similar to controlling for creatinine in a urine sample if you were to do that. Uh, there's something very unique about this time period in pregnancy. Does anybody know here what's happening in the third trimester of pregnancy to that developing um, infant or fetus? Um, that's when there's exponential physiological and skeletal growth. So this baby is starting to grow a whole lot. Its brain is pretty well formed at this point. Its lungs are getting well formed. And now there's a lot of physical growth, particularly skeletal. And so what that baby's doing is 
pulling as much of that calcium from the mom as it can. So if that mom has a history of being exposed to lead, and we know that lead and calcium are very similar chemically, um, and the, the baby would mistakenly pull lead thinking that it was calcium. So if the mom has lead in her bones, that baby's gonna pull that lead. So this is what we think that we're seeing is this peak of exposure to lead in the third trimester which is due to that exponential skeletal growth. And because the mom was exposed to lead and had lead in her blood and her bones, that it directly went into the fetal system. The other thing to note about this is that if we were to look at certain time points or just one or two time points, we might miss this peak totally. We might not see that this child was highly exposed to lead during the third trimester. So we might not think that there was an association with lead and an adverse outcome. So it's demonstrating that we can look at that intensity of exposure over time. This is uh, just another graphic of what we actually do with the tooth. So we slice it in half. Um, you can see the neonatal line in green. We use a, a laser to ablate that material. And then that um, ablated material goes into a, a mass spec where we can look at peaks of multiple different chemicals. When Mara and I first wrote this grant to do this project, and when Manish first started validating the metals, we were very focused on three particular metals because of demonstration of neurotoxicity. So we were focused on lead, manganese, and zinc. The data that we'll be talking about today has more than 16 different metals because we've expanded the analytical technology to be able to look at more different metals. We've also expanded the statistical approach so we can manage data with more chemicals in it. So how exactly do we do that? How do we link this high dimensional time series mixtures data with the health outcome? In order to understand that, I'll start with um, one of the methods that we use to look at mixtures at a single time point. And the most common method that we're using at Mount Sinai is weighted quantile sum regression. We're a little biased to this method because it was developed at Sinai, but it's also a really good method. There's many different, there's, um, there's now uh, BKMR or uh, Bayesian kernel machine regression. There's GQ computation, there's elastic net. There are many different methods that you can use to look at mixtures. And often they're very nuanced to your specific question. One of the specific questions that I'm interested in is what is the effect of the mixture? What is the effect of all of those chemicals together on a health outcome? And that's exactly what WQS allows us to do is look at the effect of the mixture. One of the drawbacks of WQS is we can't look at the interaction between different chemicals, um, but we can look at the overall effect of the mixture and then we can backtrack. And if there is an association with that mixture, we can look at what is it in that mixture that's the heavy hitter? What is the one chemical or two chemicals that seem to be causing the greatest effect? Are those the ones that we need to pay attention to for a public health intervention or when we're talking to moms about um, safety during pregnancy? But in brief, the WQS is a method to look at correlated components that are combined into an index that is then scored into, comp into quartiles. So basically what we do is look at the association between each one of the individual chemicals we're interested in. So manganese and the health outcome. So let's say IQ, zinc and IQ and lead and IQ. So we take each one of those associations and we um, sum them together into a weighted index that's constrained to zero to one. So because they're weighted, each one is representing their individual association with the health outcome. And because it's constrained to zero to one, we can backtrack and see what the percentage is because all three of those should add up to one. The other interesting point is that we can look both in the positive direction and look in the negative direction. So we can look to see whether the components in our mixture are associated with an increased IQ or associated with a decreased IQ. So we can look in both directions and that allows us to look at whether the compounds in the mixture are protective or harmful. And many of the metals that we're interested in are both. Lead we know is a paradigmatic neurotoxicant. There's no benefit of lead. Manganese on the other hand can be very neuroprotective. It's physiological and necessary for brain development but too much or too less could have adverse effects on the brain. And WQS allows us to look in both of those directions. So I do want to note again that WQS traditionally or generalized WQS is looking at a single time point of those mixtures. Uh, Chris, um, who developed WQS along with Paul Curtin and um, Elza Rechtman at Mount Sinai, extended the WQS to be able to look at a lag WQS or repeated exposure to those mixtures over time. So this is borrowed much from um, 
economics, the concept of distributed lag models that allow you to look not just at the week of exposure that you're interested in, but what happened the week prior and the week prior and the week prior, accounting for all those effects when you look at the overall effect of the mixture model. So they, um, they developed this lag WQS to look at time series data. And so this is just the generalized WQS on the top. And here's the lag WQS. So you can see in the WQS, I've expanded the metal mixture a little bit. So we have at a single time point in the top, we have arsenic, barium, manganese, on and on and on until zinc. We're creating that index and looking at an outcome. In lag WQS, we create a WQS index for each one of those time periods between the second trimester of pregnancy up until the time when the tooth was lost. And we do it in weeks. So we do a WQS for the metal mixture at week one, week two, week three, all the way up till however much data we have. Um, in today's work, I think I'm stopping at 50 or between 40 and 50, um, largely because we're still proving that the method works. Um, and then we'll expand the data all the way out once we have that. So once we have this, and this is just a graphic um, with fake data, but once we have that beta and confidence interval for each one of those weeks, we plot them and apply a low S smoother. So that's that black line. So we smooth all those points to try to look at where does this line deviate from zero and where is this, this, the suggestion of a critical window? So each one of these, again, we're looking at time since birth on the bottom. And then the zero means that there's no effect or no association. And if that low S smoother goes below zero or above zero, as well as that band, the gray band is the 95% confidence interval, then we have the suggestion of a sensitive window. So I'm showing this because once we show real data, I'll, I'll show you something similar with the smoothers and the confidence intervals. And we're looking to see whether we can identify windows um, that are either protective or adverse or harmful. So I've talked to you about two of the tools, the tooth, and then the, the statistical methods that we use to look at the tooth. The third method, and this is the one that's the nearest and the dearest to my heart, is the, the tool that we use to look at the brain, and that's magnetic resonance imaging. So magnetic resonance imaging, or MRI, is a tool that has widely been used in psychology and developmental psych for the last couple decades, but because of improved technology, because it's slightly more affordable, um, because they can make the scans a little bit faster, it's um, in the last 10 years or so, it's been used more widely in children's environmental health. And I'll talk a little bit about what we're measuring in the brain, and then I'll finally talk about what we're actually doing with this um, in our study. So just real briefly, anatomical or structural is the static measurements of morphologic changes in the brain or volumetric. So it's looking at a static image of the brain. It's what you might see if you were looking at a tumor or looking to see whether you could see changes in certain volume sub, uh, subcortical structures in the brain. Uh, diffusion sensor imaging or DTI is a way to look at white matter microstructure. And more than it is looking at structure, it's looking at connectivity or how different regions of the brain are connected um, statically. And then finally, there's functional MRI. And this is an indirect measure of neural activity. So this is what is the brain actually doing? Um, how are these regions in the brain activating together or activating um, in a non-correlated pattern? And that gives us a lot of information about how the brain is talking to each other or how the brain regions are talking to each other. Um, magnetic resonance imaging, I, I think it's interesting to know how it works, just real briefly. Um, so it works on the fundamental properties of, of, of water, and we're 80% water, so our cells are all made of water, which is H2O. So it has these positive hydrogen atoms, so 80% of our body has these hydrogen atoms that are precessing randomly in our body, meaning they're rotating pretty randomly in our body. And once we apply a magnetic field, all of them line up all of those positive ions come in the same direction. So this is what we do when we put the head coil on a child and put them in the magnet, is get all of those hydrogen atoms in the brain to line up. But even if you pass by the magnet, the hydrogen atoms in your body are kind of moving in that direction. They long to get in that direction. So this is what the, in the top is the outside the magnetic field and these hydrogen atoms are randomly oriented. Inside the magnetic field, they all line up. So we put the child or we put the head coil on, and we put the child in the scanner, we turn the magnet on, all of the protons line up, 
Then we turn on another magnetic field to flip them in the other direction. And what we do is allow them to precess naturally or return to that naturally oriented state. And the critical piece to this technology is that each one of the different tissues in our brain and our body precess or return to that state at their own characteristic time or um, space. So we can look to see whether there's a difference. We know that cerebral spinal fluid precesses very differently than white matter or gray matter. So we can look with very high temporal and spatial resolution um, in the brain and differentiate those different um, types of tissues in the brain. Um, I'm going to go through this just a little bit quickly um, because you guys have already been here half an hour uh, and I want to get to the cool data, but I just wanted to show you what we can do and what has been done with structural MRI data. So again, I mentioned that you can look at some of the basic measurements or metrics we use in volumetric. Um, we use volume, which is the density of neurons or the brain cells in gray matter. We can separate from cortical thickness, uh, cortical volumes and subcortical volumes. So we could be interested in the whole brain or we could have a very specific question that we wanna look at amygdala volume or we wanna look at olfactory bulb volume. So to do that, we would do a volumetric scan. We can look at thickness. This is the combined thickness of the layers of the cerebral cortex. And you can see in that figure on the right that this is where the gray matter is on top of the white matter. And we're looking specifically at the thickness of that gray matter, which has been associated with um, different health outcomes. And we can look at total surface area. As I mentioned, developmental psychologists have been using these tools for many years. So this is a demonstration of the nonlinearity of gray matter maturation throughout childhood. And an indication that we should be looking at multiple time points when we're looking at the brain, not just a single time point. But this is a handful of kids, I think about 15 kids that were followed from when they were five years to 20, 25 years of age or 20 years of age. And what we're looking at on the in the color is the gray matter volume. And you can see that it's not just growing, it's actually decreasing, right? So we see this peak of gray matter in adolescence and early childhood that actually starts to decrease um, over time. And this is natural normal development that we really didn't understand until we were able to track these using these tools. This has been used commonly in, to look at different um, structural changes in uh, psychopathology. So in things like um, autism and ADHD. So this is an example of how we've used um, of how researchers have used volumetric MRI to look at um, development of the cerebellum, which is um, highly uh, targeted in diseases like ADHD. On the top in blue, you're looking at development of the cerebellum over time from eight to 18. And you can see this developmental slope if you're looking at patients um, that have ADHD, there's two main types, or there's many types, but there's two different types of ADHD. There's those kids who have ADHD during childhood, and once they reach um, the end of their adolescence and adulthood, they kind of level out. They, their ADHD symptoms subside. There's another type of ADHD where when they reach that peak in um, late adolescence and adulthood, their ADHD actually gets worse. And we can see this in the brain. So you can see in the red, these are the patients who have the worst outcome and their brain volumes decrease way more than normal and even more than um, ADHD who recovers. So this is just a demonstration of how volumetric MRI can be used to look at um, changes in the brain that may be associated with psychopathology. DTI, diffusion tensor imaging, um, leverages the diffusion of water through the brain. Um, the concept is that uh, the, the white matter is, if it's more myelinated, the oxygen or the water is gonna move through that uh, more directly or uniformly, more anisotropically, which is what we look at. Um, and uh, I'm gonna skip, uh, besides showing these, because this is one of my kids back there, um, if you can't recognize them. Um, but then one of the cool things, as I mentioned, is not only can we look at uh, white matter tracks in the brain, but we can start to look at directionality and whether or not things are moving in the right direction or whether something has changed the direction that the white matter fibers are moving in the brain. Um, I wanna focus a little bit more on resting state or on functional MRI, because this is what we're doing. Um, we're doing all of these modalities in the kids in the progress study that I'll talk about, but resting state is really allowing us to look at how the brain is functioning. Um, and it's it's a broadly used in methodology to use in kids. And we'll talk about a little bit why, but what, what resting state, what functional MRI is measuring is the level of oxygenation in the brain. And the theory is that if a brain region is in demand, then there's more need for glucose, more need for oxygen. There's more blood flow, bringing more oxygenated blood through there and oxygenated blood versus deoxygenated blood gives a very different MRI signal. So we can look and see when that change is happening. So on the top, we're looking at 
um, oxygenated blood and deoxygenated blood in a basic state or an in unactivated state, and then in an activated state. And you can see that there's a lot more red in the activated state. So there's a lot more oxygenated blood than deoxygenated blood. And we can capture this bold signal um, with the MRI when a brain is, is, is functioning or doing a task. So while this is a really cool methodology, when we tried to do this with kids, it was very hard. I don't know if any of you have ever been in an MRI scanner or ever asked a child to stay still, um, and it's very hard. So when we put a kid in the scanner, one of the critical things is that we have to encourage them to stay as still as possible because any movement creates artifact. So once we get a kid in a scanner, and if you ask them to do anything, if you ask them to tap their fingers, they'll move their head and their fingers. If you ask them to focus on something on the screen, they'll, they'll touch their lip, they'll, do, they'll move, and all of that creates artifact. So it really made task-based fMRI, or when we're trying to look at activation while the child is doing something, it wasn't working. So investigators started to explore what was happening in the brain when there wasn't a task. And what they realized is that most brain consumption, or most of this differential between oxygenated and deoxygenated blood, is not necessarily driven by a response to external stimuli, but these brain regions are actually connected at rest. Um, and this is a demonstration of that. So at rest, the spontaneous fluctuations in the bold signal are correlated between brain networks that are working together when they are experiencing a task. So at the top, we're looking at the bold signal between the left and the right motor cortex. We know that our left and right motor cortex are working together, and that's what we see in their bold patterns, is that even at rest, they're very highly correlated. On the bottom, we're looking at the left motor um, cortex and the left visual cortex. So not always highly correlated, depending on what you're doing. And they're not correlated at rest. And this is reflected in the very low correlation between their bold patterns. So this really revolutionized how we could look at functional changes in the brain in kids, because we could put them in the scanner. And instead of asking to do something, we asked them just to space out, just to, we might put like a city scene on the background or a calming scene, or ask them just to look at a plus sign, but they're not moving their eyes anywhere. There's no activity. They're just resting and we're trying to keep them to stay awake. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, MRI has been used in developmental psychology for decades, but it's only really been recently that it's been used to look at the impact of environmental exposures on brain changes. And I can't talk about this research without acknowledging the work of Kim Cecil, who works at the Cincinnati in the Cincinnati Lead Study, where they've looked at um, children who were highly exposed to lead um, around five years of age and followed them up. Um, so she's a huge influence on our work. One of the things that she's doing differently is that she's scanning them when they're adults. So their exposures were when they were children and they're waiting 20 to 25 years in their follow-up um, and scanning them now. And I don't want you to pay too much attention to the complexity of this. I just wanna demonstrate that when they do bring in those adults and look at the associations with early life lead exposure, they're seeing considerable volume loss in those brains. So using structural MRI, and they're also seeing changes in white matter microstructure using DTI. Um, and they've really done a great job with this population of controlling out other exposures and looking at socioeconomic factors and really drilling down that some of these effects that they're seeing that are persistent throughout adulthood are due to lead exposure. Um, the work that I started doing at Columbia University with Virginia Rao and Brad Peterson um, was in a was one of the first studies that I've seen that really looked at um, fetal and early life exposure and then brought the kids back and scanned them. So I mentioned the chlorpyrifos example that we were studying a population of women who were using residential pesticides during pregnancy. So what we did in this pilot study was enroll um, a pilot of 20 kids who we knew were highly exposed to chlorpyrifos during pregnancy and 20 kids who weren't. And those 20 kids who weren't were also not exposed to um, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, so indicative of air pollution. They weren't exposed to environmental tobacco smoke. Um, we measured cotinine in the mom's blood. Um, and so what we did in this graphic is, is the green is the typical developing brain. And then we overlaid those brains of the kids with chlorpyrifos exposure on top. And again, I'm not going to go through too much, except that you can see a whole rainbow of effects. So if it's a it's if it's a brighter red color, then it means that it's um it's a thickening. So the the cerebral cortex was thicker in the kids who are exposed. And if you see the purple colors, there's decreases or thinning of that cerebral cortex. And we see directions, um, we see changes in both directions. 
One of the interesting things is that in these kids, when we measure them and we do assessments in the lab, we see changes in uh, working memory. And one of the places that we see significant changes in volume in the volume or surface measures is in the prefrontal cortex. And if we were to see if there's a home for working memory in the brain, it is in the prefrontal cortex. So we are starting to be able to tell a story between what we're seeing in the brain and in the behavioral outcomes. Once I moved over to Mount Sinai, we expanded out of chlorpyrifos and out of um, metals and started to look at things like um, polybrominated flame retardants and try to see whether there were associations in the brain. And this is the results of another pilot study that I won't go into detail, but it's using that resting state to look and see, are there changes in the way areas of the brain are talking to each other if these children were more highly exposed to um, flame retardants? Um, and this is an example that, that we're leading into, again, looking at um, particularly at emotional brain areas. So if we see a kid that has um, increased anxiety, do they see changes? Do we see changes in the brain that may be subserving those um, behavioral outcomes that we're observing? So in the past and, and recently, as I've acknowledged Kim and, um, and our prior work, um, as I started to move forward, we identified that there were a couple things that were lacking in the research in this field of environmental neuroscience. Um, and that was that most of the time, most of those studies were looking at exposures at a single time point. They were either looking at a five-year blood lead or we were looking at cord blood, but they weren't looking at these critical windows. They weren't looking at exposure over time. They weren't looking at mixtures. They were looking at lead. We we're looking at, um, at PBDEs, which in itself is a mixture, but we used an index that represented all of them. And they weren't looking at developmental trajectories. We've shown that the brain is very nonlinear. And if you look at the wrong time point, you might miss whether or not there's been an, an, an outcome to see. Uh, so that's why working with Mara and her team uh, at INSP and up in Mexico City, and with Bob Wright, we started working within the Progress Cohort. So many of you have heard and are quite familiar with the Progress Cohort. So this is a cohort of pregnant women who are enrolled between 2006 and 2011. Um, throughout the time, uh, throughout the pregnancy and then throughout their lives, and now the kids are about 14 years old, there's been extensive exposure assessment, um, blood samples collected, urine samples, um, bones. So they've measured um, metals, particularly lead in bones, and we've collected teeth. Um, there's also satellite and ground monitoring to allow us to look at air pollution exposure, um, green space, and other types of um, community-based exposures. And then those kids have been followed up over time, and the main hypotheses were to look at the effect of these environmental exposures on growth and obesity, on respiratory outcomes, and then, in my interest, in neurodevelopmental outcomes. So several years ago, we started a small sub-study where we were putting some of these kids into the scanner to look at the association between um, metals and teeth, behavioral outcomes, and imaging outcomes in the brain. And so I'll talk for the next few minutes about some of the preliminary data that we've had coming out of this study. So we've been doing this study for four years now. Um, our goal is to enroll about 250 kids, uh, despite some serious setbacks in the last couple of years, like covid um, and a strike at the university. We're, we're on track to finish. So we have about 140 kids enrolled at this point. Um, and most of those kids have already donated a tooth. And so I'll show you some of that preliminary data um, looking at the teeth and the behavioral outcomes and then the teeth and the brain. Uh, so as I mentioned, Elza Reckman is a postdoc or a new faculty uh, at Mount Sinai. And uh, I think my zeros moved a little bit. Um, but these are examples of looking at, um, this is, these are 16 different metals that we're now measuring in the teeth. And I didn't bother to tell you which ones they are because that's not the important point. The important point is that even in this, um, in these, this, so these are two different teeth, but we're seeing that there's not a lot of, there's not a whole lot of straight lines. There's a whole lot of lines that are fluctuating over time with small micro fluctuations and then some big ones. And this is very similar to what we saw with that graphic of the tooth, that there was a peak of lead that we saw in the third trimester. And so I think that there's these graphics, and then again with this uh, GIF, is demonstrating that if we had just seen a flat line, we could probably just measure one time point, or we could take the tooth and we could sum up the measures. Um, but what we're really interested in now is leveraging this data to look at weekly exposure throughout gestation and early childhood to see whether there are critical windows um, based on week or based on a couple weeks together that may be associated with health outcomes in the children. <laughs> 
So we, um, to measure their behavioral outcomes, we administered the BASC, which is the Behavioral Assessment System for Children and captures um, the main things we were interested in are the internalizing disorders like anxiety and depression, and then externalizing disorders like hy hyperactivity. So this is the, um, the lag WQS plot of the behavioral symptoms index. Um, and uh, the composite score of internalizing and externalizing. So it's the total behavioral score. Do we see changes in the behavioral outcomes of these kids when they have lead exposure? And you've seen this lag WQS plot. So on the X axis, we're looking at um, minus 20 weeks all the way up to 40 weeks with birth identified with the zero red circle. And then we're looking at that time varying effect of the mixture. So the beta at each one of those weeks. I think what I should have done is plotted at the bottom, like a rug plot of when each one of those weeks is, but you can picture that there's, um, you know, there's about 60 of these time points. So there's about 60 of these WQSs with multiple metals. And then we smoothed it and administered the statistics to get the 95% confidence interval. And what we think we see is this um, sensitive time period postnatally. So we're not seeing too much prenatally, but we're seeing this postnatal time period. And the peak window we think is right around 43 weeks. It's just going up and that's when we start to run out of data right now. Um, so we looked at this 43rd week to see, um, okay, so we see an association with the mixture. So there's an association between exposure to the mixture postnatally and changes in behavioral outcomes in the kids when they're eight or 10 years old. What are the metals in that mixture that seem to be um, most strongly driving this association? This is when it gets admittedly a little bit ugly because we're working on this. This is a novel. So if anybody has any ideas of how to look at this or plot this, I'm willing to hear. But this was a whole lot easier when we had three metals and to do a spaghetti plot. Now we have, I've even narrowed it down. So we're just looking at 10 metals. And now we're looking at this big mess. So what are the exposures? What are the metals during the critical time windows when we might be having, uh, which when we could determine which are the, the main heavy drivers? So we looked particularly at the 43rd week postnatally for that beta. And now I'm blocking out that whole time period and trying to see what are the metals in there that are most strongly influencing. So it's a variable weight is on the y-axis. So if the weight is higher, it's more, more predominant or strongly driving that association. So we can see that there's metals like um, arsenic, which we know is a neurotoxicant, manganese, which can be protective or neurotoxicant, but most of the time in the study, we're seeing it as a toxicant, and then tin. So I'm, I'm hesitant to interpret these too much because it's our first time that we've done this. Um, and we're still working with the, the, um, with the tooth lab to make sure that we have good detection frequencies, that we have robust data. But I think what this is indicating is that we do see a critical window postnatally when these toxic metals may be associated. And I do wanna mention that uh, the WQS, we can look in the positive and the negative direction. So this is looking in the positive direction or harmful direction. So these are the metals that we see that have an adverse effect on behavioral outcomes. So when we look in the opposite direction, so on the bottom, we're now looking at the constraining it to the negative. So we're looking at, are any of those metals in our mixture beneficial? Do any of them protect against um, behavioral outcomes? And again, you see this slope and we see that in the same time period, um, we see an opposite effect. So some of the metals in that time period are adversely associated with the health outcome. And some of these metals are positively associated. So there's a reduction in kids with internalizing disorders. So what are those metals that may be protective? And one of the metals that we're seeing, the arrow slipped a little bit. One of the metals that seems to be protective against internalizing disorders is barium. Barium was not hugely on my radar as a neuro metal, as a metals toxicologist. I was more interested in zinc, copper, manganese, lead. Um, but another investigator at Mount Sinai, uh, Christine Austin, is looking at barium and a profile of other metals that may be, she's working on how to develop this profile for the differentiation of breastfeeding versus solid foods. So there's something about um, barium that changes when you are breastfed, when you're formula fed, and when you start e eating food. So we're way, this research is way too preliminary for me to be able to make a statement about whether or not breastfeeding is more protective or whether it's detrimental. But what we do know is that if you look in the, the, the red, um, these are barium concentrations that we see in the teeth if you're exclusively breastfed. And we see that there's more barium in these child's in children's teeth if you're exclusively breastfeeding. But the interesting thing is that we can also characterize using barium the switch from um, breastfeeding to solid food introduction. So I'm not a nutritional epidemiologist and I look forward to working with Christine on this, 
there's something really interesting about the switch in metals that we see when we're looking at protective, and it may have something to do with nutrition. Uh, so in addition to looking at the link between um, the metals exposure and the behavioral outcomes, we have looked at some of the link between the metals exposure and the brain outcomes. And I'll just go through a couple of these because the sample size is smaller. Um, we, we're doing this right now on about 80 kids. And while the lag WQS is fairly efficient because you don't need a lot of degrees of freedom, it's still statistically kind of power hungry. Um, so with 80, I'm hesitant to make any conclusions from this, but I think we have some suggestions of some pretty cool outcomes. So uh, Azura Infernizzi is a, is a postdoc in my lab whose expertise is looking at resting state data using graph theory approaches. So graph theory is really a way to break down the brain mathematically into a series of nodes and um, edges. The best example that I've heard her talk about is um, it's kind of like the uh, airport system globally. And if you have an international airport that's connected to more international airports, so JFK connected to Charles de Gaulle, um, connected to Mexico City, means that JFK is a very is a very high centrality. It's very connected to other nodes that are very central. I'm from Omaha, Nebraska. I've got very low centrality there because not only am I not connected to any international airports, I have to connect through smaller airports to get to those bigger airports. So it's really to look and see what are the strong connections in the brain? How are they talking to each other and who else are they talking to? And we can look at this in a typically developing brain and then see if that shifts when you have increased exposures. Um, the other thing is to look at uh, uh, so uh, eigenvector centrality, which I'm talking about, is the EC, and then you can also look at efficiency or how fast and efficiently is, is information moving along those nodes or on those edges between nodes. So we looked, um, we a priori selected regions of the brain because of the behavioral outcomes suggesting that these kids had more internalizing problems like anxiety and depression. We selected regions of the brain that we know are subserving these outcomes. So um, in particular, the ACC or the anterior cingulate, the globus pallidus and the insula, these are all brain networks that are associated with behavioral outcomes like anxiety and depression. And we wanted to look and see specifically, did metal exposures early in life disrupt how these brain regions are talking to each other? So this is looking at the lag WQS and insula centrality. So we were very familiar with this now, the x-axis is time, the y-axis is this time varying association. And we're looking at when that uh, confidence interval deviates from zero or is um, not overlapping with zero. So this is looking at the insula and we can see that there does seem to be this window postnatally. Again, very similar to that window we saw with the behavioral outcomes. And then when we're looking at the metals, we're seeing some overlap in the metals that we're seeing having the most impact in this time period, in particular things like metal, uh, manganese, um, and then seeing a little bit of an impact of lead. Again, I'm hesitant to interpret exactly what we know with the metals, but I think what we're seeing is this story we can start to tell between the critical window postnatally and some of the neurotoxicant metals having an adverse effect on um, the way the brain is communicating with other regions of the brain. We did this with the globus pallidus, and here we see that there's, um, with metal exposures, it's, it's always below zero, so we don't see necessarily a strong critical window. We see a large critical window. Um, and when we look at those metals, we looked at them, we divided the metals to try to look prenatally versus postnatally. So if you look back, some of the metals um, that we see prenatally don't overlap with the metals that we see postnatally. We also think this is really interesting because it's saying that the metal mixture may change or the vulnerability in your brain may change pre prenatally and postnatally. So some metals that may impact the brain while it's, while it's developing in utero may be different than the metals that are impacting your brain postnatally. So we're again trying to differentiate this, but I think we're um, proving some feasibility of using this method to look at, at critical windows. And again, we looked at um, global efficiency. So this is that overall communication in the brain and how efficiently is the brain, our brain regions talking to each other. And we see these two different critical windows, prenatally and postnatally, and identify some of the metals. Prenatally, the heavy hitters seem to be zinc, manganese, and tin. And postnatally, we add in um, magnesium and lead that seem to have the most impact on global efficiency in the brain. So I think in the last 45 minutes or so, I've talked about the tools that we're using in my lab to try to get at what I think is the field of children's neuroexposomics. 
what is the totality of exposures? Starting simply with 10 metals, it's by no means the exposome, but it's a whole lot more than looking at lead um, and how we use the teeth to objectively reconstruct gestational and early childhood exposure, how we use the lag WQS to leverage this high dimensional time series data to try to look at a health out association with a health outcome. And then how we use the MRI to do in vivo assessments of structural and functional brain changes and ultimately try to link this to tell a story. Can we see that early life exposures impact the brain and these brain changes are associated with um, behavioral outcomes? There are many, many people to thank um, up at um, Icon School of Medicine in New York, uh, in particular my postdocs and uh, Manish for developed Manish and Christine for the methodology. But I can't feel more gratitude than for the team at INSP who make this all work, um, uh, who have followed the team for now 14, 15 years, and who work diligently on Saturdays to bring these kids into the scanner. And it's no easy task to put a child in a scanner and then do behavioral assessments. And they do just a beautiful job. Um, and they're incredibly patient and, and great at their job. Uh, and then, of course, the, the families and um, the rest of the field staff. And thanks to all of you who are probably late getting home because we were late getting here. But if there's any time, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. I was wondering the graphs you show, and I think you called them something like spaghetti, all the color lines. And I think it says uh, weight or something on the y x. It was something with weight. Yeah. Aha. Uh -huh. But can you explain a bit more? Because I'm, it's, yeah, it was uh, sometimes for me hard to, fo to follow. Like, these were like the exposures. It's not the exposure of, of the children. It's like already the correlation that you find of that particular element on that particular point in time and how it correlates with then the outcomes. Yeah. So on the left, is that the, the graphic? Uh huh. Yeah, that's one of them. The the x axis on both is the same time mm -hmm. in weeks. The y axis on the one on the left is the time varying association, the beta mm -hmm. smoothed out. So it's looking at at minus twenty, we see a beta of point zero five. Does that make sense? At you're at now minus, at, the, at the gray figure. Yeah, on the left. Okay. So the line is at like point zero five, and we see the confidence band. Sorry. Um, so on the left, it's the association. And then I want to say on the right, I want to see which metals are driving that association. Yep. So what is the variable weight? Because the the sum, because there's sum to zero to one, I can look at the percentage of the weight. And so if the percentage is 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 high, then I can see then there's more manganese seems to be having the impact or more lead. So it it doesn't tell you anything at that point how many children were exposed to that particular element no. at that time. Ah, okay. It just tells you when there's an association between the metals and the outcome, what are the metals that are driving that? It doesn't tell you which ones are high or which ones are low. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Thank you, Megan. Ah, there are... There are a couple of questions in the in by Zoom. Oh, sure. No, nos dan permiso que vayamos una en Zoom y una presencial. Sí. Um, Samuel David Osorio pregunta: Which are the most important expositions for Mexican or Latin American children, according with your exposome work? 
I can answer that scientifically and less scientifically. Um, and I got this question a lot when I was working more in, in New York. Uh, so I'll, I will get to the answer to that question. Um, and one of the things in that I did a lot in New York was a lot of community-based outreach and going to talk to the moms. And a lot of these moms were from low-income populations. And I was looking at things like flame retardants. So I couldn't tell them to get rid of their couches, right? Mm -hmm. When I went to a high socioeconomic place like Connecticut and, and gave the same talk, the moms came back to me and said, we did what you said. We threw out all of our furniture and bought new furniture. And I was like, don't do that. That's not what I said. What I said was, let's think about the things that we can change that make the most dramatic impact. And for low-income families, that wasn't going to be throwing out their couch, but it was doing things like wet mopping. So making sure that we weren't just dry dusting and pushing dust around, but wet dusting and wiping the windowsills, making sure that you have a good practice of taking off your shoes when you come in and washing your hands. So what were the things that we could do that were um, effective for many chemicals that were feasible and that were affordable. Um, when I worked with the moms that had a lot of pesticide exposure, we did very simple things like brought in trash bags that tied um, and we brought in Ziploc bags and we talked to them about keeping food in stored containers. Um, so we tried to do things that were feasible. Um, so I think that's getting at what is the most important exposure. Um, the other thing that came out of the work in Colombia is that we saw that while environmental chemicals, even lead can explain three to 4% of IQ, maternal nurturing, paternal nurturing, a community environment and a stimulating environment explains much more like 40% of a child's behavioral and emotional outcomes. So while the environment is extremely important, I've spent my life studying it and I will continue to, the quality of the home environment trumps all of that. So providing an environment in your home where you're reading books to your kids, you're getting them outside to play, you're listening to them, those kinds of things have statistically proven to control or to explain more of the variance in a child's health outcomes than environmental exposures. So that's my off the cuff answer. Um, and I think one of the things that we're still very focused on in Mexican population that may be intervenable upon is lead exposure. And this is really um, Mara's Mara's work showing that um, that there is still lead exposure from pottery use, from um, non-intentional ingestion in Mexican homes. And we do know from work in other countries that that's a very modifiable exposure. It doesn't have to exist anymore. Families don't have a lot of control about air pollution, but they can definitely control things like lead, um, pesticides, and other exposures in their homes. So I hope that answers that question. Megan, there are many questions for you. Oh. So I hope you're not too tired. I think that it's Diana, Mayra, Mayra, Mayra. And then there's one, there are two in the internet and also Belém. Oh, no. no? So Mayra. Sorry, my English is not perfect. Um, I have a question because I've read literature that says like limit of detection of heavy metalloids in urine or blood, but I have read literature uh, in heavy, metal heavy metalloids in, in teeth, but I haven't read like anything like limits of detection. Is it because they are like proportions of calcium and heavy metalloids or because, I don't know, it's in, not in another <laughs> published article or something like that. With that technique, like, the laser ablated inductively coupled mass spectrometry or something like that? It, yes, the laser, the ICP mass spec inductively coupled, coupled um, mass, mass spectrometry. spectrometry. So is the question about why we use calcium? The question is, uh, well, when they measured like heavy metalloids in another articles, they use like uh, limits of detection in urine or blood. But in some literature I read from Manish, uh, the dentist you, you commented, I haven't read like anything like of those values. I don't know because they are proportions of calcium and these yes, metals. That's exactly it. That we're rather than looking at a concentration, we're looking at a ratio or a proportion to calcium. So some of them are very low and some of them are zero. Um, but these are looking at the ones where we have hits um, or levels above that limit of detection. So there is the same concept of of limits of detection. Um, but I think the big difference between the, the traditional biomarker literature where we often show the de percent detection frequency is that we're using all of the data controlled to calcium because uh, to try to show data for each individual. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Gracias, Mayra. There's one from Horacio Riojas. Horacio is the head of the Environmental Science Division here at INSP. 
he couldn't make it in person because of family situation, but he, he attended remotely. He says, could you explain a little, a little more how do you translate the colors of the MRI into numbers for the graphics? We would like to use these MRI methods in setting such a mining zones. Is, it, is this very expensive? So, so the answer to the first question, I, I need a little bit more detail and I'm so happy to have a call with him offline to think about, you know, if he's asking about where we see the reds versus where we see the purples, um, basically what we're translating is um, measuring the volumetric changes in the brain and giving them a color code based on the, the thickness difference. Um, so as I said, in the chlorpyrifos example, um, we have the green is a typically developing brain. If we have red, it means that there's a greater or thickening in the kids who were more highly exposed to chlorpyrifos. And that's a that's a statistical measurement. So we're actually looking at millimeters of the brain in thickness and giving it a, a numeric value and then a color metric value. Um, so I think that's really well described in the in the paper about how we use colors to try to display that graphically. Um, and I think it's an excellent idea to do this in mining zones. We have a study where we're doing this in Italy, looking at the effects of um, ferroalloy smelting. So in Northern Italy, it's uh, the highest industrial region in Europe. And um, based on occupational studies, uh, where we did use MRI to look at brain changes, we're now looking at kids. So looking in occupational settings is um, it's certainly feasible and, and functional. Um, the, whether it's expensive depends on your budget, <laughs> um, right? Uh, so I'm happy to talk about wherever he is. Um, if he's doing the MRIs here, we can talk about um, how much it costs. Um, it is it is expensive. It is an investment. And that is one of the reasons we're only studying about 250 kids out of the whole 750 or so that they have followed um, because it's both time and costly. So, okay. Any other question in the room? No? Can we go to the next one? I think this is the last one. It's Ricardo Garcia. Is there a way to prevent or delay brain damage after we have the results of high tissular concentrations of metals? I think that's a very interesting question. There are ways to chelate when you have high metal exposure, but one of the profound things is about this research is that these are low level environmental exposures. These are exposures that we would not think of as clinically significant. You wouldn't see an exposure and no physician would ever intervene upon the lead levels that we're seeing. In fact, I think in the progress cohort over the past 14 years, when you've measured blood leads, we've only seen at a single time point, one child who had a blood lead that was reportable or over five micrograms per deciliter. And that was in a very defined exposure. We knew where that exposure was coming from. Um, so these exposures are not something that we would remediate um, for. And I think that's even more important that these are low levels exposures that we need to fight for legislation to change um, to try to reduce these exposures. So uh, Horacio says, thank you. Uh, no, Horacio no. says, thank you. Oh no, Sandra Avalos, yeah. Hello, thank you for your presentation. My question is, did you consider to evaluate the negative and positive impacts of fluoride? Recently, there's an interesting discussion of the effects it may generate in the IQ and behavior. Yes, we should and we will look at fluoride. Um, in this study right now, actually, they're, uh, um, they're working on measuring the fluoride in teeth. So they've just published an a, a analytical method to be able to measure the fluoride in teeth. Um, one of the tricky things is is prioritizing. So when we when we do the metals analysis, it's it's considered non-destructive. We just core the tooth and we take half the tooth. Um, so that tooth is reusable. So we can either do a repeated measurement of those metals or we can ar archive it for other things. Many of the other methods that we're looking at. So we have a method to look at more of the um, organics like pesticides and phthalates, but those methods require so much more tooth matter that they destroy the teeth. Um, and now we've developed a method of fluoride. So it's really trying to optimize what should we do with these teeth to get the most out of them. Um, but to, the short answer to your question is yes, we are looking at fluoride exposure and brain and behavioral outcomes. Um, and they are doing this in a couple studies in the United States. It's a, it's a fascinating and complicated question to look at fluoride. Yeah. 
Can I comment on that? Oh, please. <laughs> yeah, I think it's very challenging to study fluoride because fluoride is also a benefit. It's a good uh, element for, for teeth. So, and the, as far as I understand, the range where it is benefit is very narrow. So it will be very complicated to disentangle the toxic and the, and the positive effect for teeth. Whereas when we an, you analyze urine, it has a lot of limitation, but it's only the, the, the one that it's excreted, right? right? So, well, Megan, thank you very much. Let, let me finish this because there are no more questions and let me switch into Spanish. Eh, bueno, les queremos agradecer muchísimo que nos hayan esperado, que hayan de veras comprendido la, 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 el imprevisto que, tu, que tuvimos, pero yo quisiera invitarlos a que exploren las cortes. Esto es progres, este es un proyecto que creo que es fascinante, ¿no? De lo que es progres. Y si ustedes están interesados en salud respiratoria, hay un proyecto para salud respiratoria. Y si están interesados en salud renal, tenemos proyectos de salud renal y así para muchos órganos. Entonces, bueno, Megan hizo una presentación maravillosa. Gracias, Megan. Eh, y le ver a los, espero que esta plática también los invite a acercarse a las cortes, a los estudiantes, a los, a los y las investigadoras, a los y las estudiantas. Este, y bueno, muchísimas gracias por su comprensión y esperamos que pronto tengamos otro seminario. Eh, Luis. Ah, cierto. Muchas gracias. Cierto, cierto. Eh, el 21, 22 y 23. No. El 22, 23 y 24 de mayo vamos a tener un symposium sobre exposoma, exposoma en Latinoamérica exactamente, I'm talking about the symposium in May, eh, donde van a venir de verdad, yo creo que las grandes personalidades que están trabajando con este abordaje, va a ser en Ciudad de México, en el Instituto de Investigaciones Biomédicas de la UNAM, eh, hoy precisamente ya salió la información, ya está publicada. Pueden someter eh, proyectos para presentarse como carteles. Las pláticas son muy poquitas, son por invitación, pero pueden ir solo a escuchar o pueden someter su trabajo y presentarlo en cartel y se le va a dar mucha difusión y mucha importancia a los carteles, de tal manera que si tienen un trabajo que quieran que se los comenten, pues gente con una experiencia enorme en el tema, sometan su trabajo y van a tener muy buenos comentarios. Eh, se los aseguro, eh, ya deben de estar por llegarles. Ya hoy, hoy mandé la difusión a la, la coordinadora de la, del doctorado, al capítulo de doctores, no lo mandé al de la maestría en salud ambiental, pero lo mando mañana mismo. Y bueno, difúndanlo para quien quiera asistir. 22, 23 y 24 de mayo. Gracias, gracias Luis. ¿Algo más? Pues muchísimas gracias. Muchas gracias.